Heartbreak in India as a second wave of COVID-19 devastates the country. Oxygen supplies are running out and hospitals are overwhelmed with patients. How the international community is stepping in to help. Hello, I'm Arnold Nider and this is The Heat. For the sixth straight day, India is reporting a record number of COVID-19 cases with some 300,000 new infections every 24 hours. Countries across the globe are sending medical help, including critical oxygen supplies. Gao Yi Ming begins our coverage and a warning some of these images may be difficult to watch. India is facing an out-of-control public health crisis. Hundreds of thousands of patients are pouring into hospitals to seek treatment for COVID-19. But due to shortages of oxygen in beds, many are being turned away. This condition is a bit serious. We're standing here without oxygen and a patient in the middle of the road without any hope. It's been two hours. I've been waiting here since 8 in the morning. As far as I can see, I won't be able to get in for another hour or maybe more. I have a car and I'm sitting in it. But where will a poor person sit if he is sick? Crematoriums are working day and night to cope with the soaring deaths. The World Health Organization says this unprecedented crisis in India is beyond heartbreaking. WHO is doing everything we can, providing critical equipment and supplies, including thousands of oxygen concentrators, prefabricated mobile field hospitals and laboratory supplies. A number of nations are sending aid to help India battle this new wave of infections. China says 800 oxygen concentrators have been sent from Hong Kong to Delhi, and 10,000 more are scheduled to arrive in a week. A foreign ministry spokesperson says Beijing is willing to support Delhi with all the help it needs. We are making it clear that we stand ready to help India fight its recent outbreak. Both sides have been communicating on the matter. If India puts forward specific needs, China is willing to provide support and assistance to the best of its ability. The U.S. has promised to provide medical equipment and protective gear to India, as well as raw materials for vaccines to India's manufacturers. The State Department says it's working nonstop to deliver these supplies, and President Joe Biden has vowed to help India overcome the difficulties in its time of need. Both France and Germany have also promised to provide medical aid, including oxygen, as soon as possible. And Russia says India will receive the first batch of its Sputnik V vaccines on May the 1st. Gao Yiming, CGTN. Earlier, I had a chance to speak with Dr. Anant Barn, a global health researcher based in the Indian city of Bhopal. I started by asking him about what's driving the high infection rates. So, yes, there's a bunch of reasons probably which can be ascribed, uh, you know, one of the things which uh, was a problem was that uh, there were things uh, loosened up too early. When I say loosened up, I mean that uh, the usual public health precautions were not followed in many parts of India. Mask usage went down. There were a lot of uh, mass gatherings happening, political or religious. Uh, there were elections held, which also led to uh, a lot of mixing of individuals. Uh, the health system was also caught a little bit underprepared, even though there was experience from last year, and uh, there was not enough uh, preparation to make the health system ready for any kind of surge like this. We should have learned from uh, the, uh, the rise in infections last year, as well as the experience of many other countries, where th there have been more than one waves, uh, and we should have known that India could also probably be facing this. Red, I want to talk about variants. Uh, there are variants of the virus that uh, have made their way to India, the UK variant, the South African variant, the Brazilian variant, all in India. To what extent do you think these variants have been responsible for these surging numbers? Yeah, so what we know about pandemics and also viruses is that they evolve, right? Uh, there are mutations, there are variants. And certainly, uh, those are a cause for worry. Um, in India, there have been some attempts at tracking them uh, through genomic surveillance, and they've been able to pick up. Now, there is also talk of an Indian variant, uh, for example. So 
again, these are certainly uh, you know variants which can cause a rapid rise in the spread. Uh, in India now, we believe that uh, some of these variants are certainly responsible uh, for uh, contributing to the spread because they're more infectious in nature. The number of people who uh, an index case could infect is much higher than last year, and that could be contributing um, to uh, why we are seeing this kind of a situation unfold. There is something uh, being called the double mutant uh, a kind of variant that may be in India. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, so there's been a lot of tracking on trying to understand that what is uh, the kind of spread of infection and what might that be caused by. And when this, as I was saying earlier, when these uh, the surveillance efforts are done and uh, genomic workup is done, you realize that there might be some virus uh, uh, mutations which have happened. In this case, there are uh, viruses with double mutations, sometimes more than one uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, causes for worry uh, on that count. And uh, what typically scientists will look out for is when you have these mutations happening in the virus, does that mean that the virus is becomes more infectious? Is it able to escape being uh, picked up on a test, even a gold standard like RT-PCR? And uh, are vaccines still able to protect against these kinds of variants? So I think those are the kind of things why we need good quality lab surveillance. They tell us uh, answers to those questions. Dr. Barnan, as we, of course, see these numbers escalate, we're seeing a human tragedy unfold in India right now. We see these really heartbreaking pictures of people waiting outside hospitals, trying to get their loved ones beds in hospitals. We see people standing in lines to buy oxygen. Uh, we see this in many parts of the country. What do you know about the situation as far as hospitals and the healthcare infrastructure is concerned? Yeah, Anand, unfortunately, uh, you know, in India is certainly facing an acute crisis in, in many parts of the country. It's not just spread, uh, you know, uh, localized to one region. It's actually now in many states that there is a shortage of uh, beds, there is a shortage of ventilators, there is a shortage of even basic equipment uh, and supplies like oxygen. And uh, that is really leading to very distressing scenes of the kind that you have described, where People are waiting to just access care and be able to, um, you know, just receive oxygen um, or, or be, uh, you know, be given a bed in a hospital. Um, unfortunately, uh, this also means that a lot of people are not able to get it as they're waiting in line and there have been deaths which have happened. So this just tells us that uh, the health system is really stressed out because of the rapid uh, increase in the number of cases and uh, it's leading to really uh, sad scenes in many parts of India. You know, as you pointed out a moment ago, there is a feeling that India reopened too quickly. I mean, only a year ago, the country implemented one of the toughest lockdowns in the world. At that time, uh, the number of cases numbered in the hundreds. Uh, but now we've had other factors as well, as you've pointed out. Uh, there's politics which has been involved in this. There's an election that was allowed to take place. There was a very big religious festival that the government allowed to uh, take place. Massive election rallies have been held as well. Um, has the government recognized that these have contributed to the high numbers, and what are they doing about it? Yeah, I think in post facto, there's been some recognition that they, these might have been certainly events which would have led to um, a spread of infection. And now um, the regulatory bodies, such as the Election Commission, have stepped forward and said that we need to decrease the number of crowds uh, which are assembling. Um, and similarly, the, the, for the religious events as well, there's been an outreach done to uh, religious authorities to try to decrease the scale of events and um, you know, also um, ask them to uh, not have too many people turn up for some of these events, largely hold them symbolically. But perhaps we are already a bit late in uh, doing some of this and you know, the, the downstream impact of a lot of these impacts could be, be uh, of, of these events could be that there is a diffuse spread of infection as people return from these events um, into other parts of India. So, uh, you know, the next few weeks are going to be really crucial. Uh, hopefully, some of the steps which are being taken now around mitigation strategies like localized lockdowns will mean that the stress on the health system decreases. And after that, I think we really need to make sure that we keep adhering to the precautions as we all know which work to ensure that we don't uh, face such situ uh, situations again. Right, and India has also appealed for outside help. Uh, China is stepping in. Uh, the United States has pledged assistance as well. Uh, what's been the response so far? Yeah, so I, I think the response has been fairly encouraging. Uh, many countries have stepped forward. You know, India also uh, earlier in the pandemic has been uh, fairly giving. Uh, you know, they've uh, sent out vaccines to many countries. 
they also sent out supplies they helped uh, export uh, you know uh, ppe kits etc uh, as you know india is also among the world's largest uh, producers of vaccines and and has played a very very important role in global health in that uh, aspect but now india needs help india needs uh, resources india needs anything from oxygen um, to ventilators and it's great to see that the global community has began to step up there are many countries which are already flying in supplies and hopefully this will help uh, address uh, the acute shortage that we are seeing in many parts of india as you say india is one of the biggest uh, manufacturers and suppliers of vaccines clearly something went wrong because demand is now outstripping supply uh, why was the country so ill prepared yeah i think the challenge with countries like india uh, is also the size uh, both both the uh, geographic but also of the population and even though india has had uh, a fairly large vaccination program for covid-19 probably the second highest number of individuals uh, globally who have been vaccinated uh, but the challenge has been uh, the coverage because uh, with such a large population you will need a lot of doses um, and a lot of resources to be able to vaccinate enough people um so attempts were made but clearly we could have done perhaps better in terms of being enhancing the supply domestically uh, enhancing our efforts to cover more population now from the 1st of may the government has opened up vaccination for any man above 18 uh, hopefully in the next few weeks we will see a ramp up in the vaccination efforts so that we are able to protect more people uh, within the population Uh, there's also some concern about the numbers that we are hearing from authorities in India that there's been serious undercounting that the situation could actually be far worse than we know. Well there was data earlier uh, as well uh, from sero prevalence studies which seemed to indicate that the actual number of people who had been exposed to infection was much higher uh, than the official numbers because official numbers might depend on factors such as how many people have been tested and if there are areas where not adequate tests have been done or not enough people have turned up for testing even though they had symptoms then you might miss a lot of cases and even now there is a concern that uh, we might not be um, you know able to test enough and uh, there might be a shortage of uh, test uh, appointments there might be a, a long turnaround time for test results to come up and also the fact that many tests uh, which might be especially happening for example at home are not being cataloged as covid deaths uh, even though uh, the data coming in from say crematoria or graveyards seems to indicate that the number of deaths is much much higher than the numbers we are hearing from uh, official sources i have one final question and i know this is a difficult one but uh, would you venture to predict how long it could be before india starts turning the corner yeah well all of us are hoping this would be soon but you know unfortunately um, the the cases are continuing to rise so as i said earlier it looks like the peak is not yet here um you know hopefully with the kind of measures which have been put in especially around containment um and mitigation we might start to see uh, a reduction in the number of cases over the next few weeks but uh, may uh, at least the early part looks it looks like it will be a difficult period for india and uh, one is hopeful that uh, you know this doesn't put further stress on the health system and uh, cause the kind of um, grief and devastation that we have already seen in many parts of the country dr anand ban thanks for joining us sir thank you for for more on the international outreach and the situation in the united states let's bring in our panel joining us now from arizona is will humble He's the executive director of the Arizona Public Health Association. Here in Washington DC, Joseph Williams is the senior news editor with US News and World Report, and Dr. Kate Tilenko is the founder and CEO of Corvus Health. Thanks everyone for being with us. Uh, Kate, as we just saw and heard a great deal of suffering and agony in India, is there a lesson for the rest of the world from the Indian experience, the risk of reopening economies too early of people rushing to get their lives back to normal too quickly I think there are three lessons that India can teach the world now the first is what you mentioned that they reopened too quickly they had mass religious events very large weddings large political rallies i think as governments reopen they have to give more guidance to people about their risk budget and how to slowly enter their normal lives uh, 
uh, you know, at a slower pace than that they did before. So that's the first lesson. I think the second lesson, which the physician you interviewed mentioned, was that of surge capacity. We're now over a year into this crisis, and countries need to build better surge capacity, and that's through the entire health system. So surge capacity in health workers and beds, oxygen, medical supply, really every every part of the health system. We see that some uh, parts of India, some states such as Kerala, which did invest more in surge capacity, uh, you know, like the state of Kerala in India, um, haven't had as much of a crisis. In fact, southern India, which tends to invest more in healthcare, has been sending oxygen up to northern India. So that surge capacity is essential. And then the third lesson, long term, is India and other developing countries must invest more in health care. The WHO recommends that developing countries invest 15 percent of their gross domestic product into health care. India just invests 1.2 percent. So it really grossly underspends in the area of health care. And I guess, Kate, uh, one of the other complications is that uh, in India, as we've seen in other countries as well, including the United States, this pandemic has become very politicized. Yes, it has. And, you know, people are, are asking about, you know, the, the politics and the ethics of this. And I think that ethically we're really in a, a gray zone. We're in uncharted territory. You know, it was interesting to note that India previously had given away or, or sold vaccines you know, perhaps they had better, you know, <laughs> kept those vaccines in the country and vaccinated their own people. They would be in a much better condition if that happened. So it, it shows how, how easily this gets politicized. And leaders are elected by their citizens, not by the citizens of other countries. And, you know, we're seeing, you know, leaders trying to figure out what's best, you know, for them, uh, what's best for their own citizens, what's best politically. And I, I think that's why you, you see some of the, the balancing acts that you have. Joseph Williams here in the United States, U.S. President Joseph Biden, he held a news conference Tuesday afternoon at the White House on the pandemic. Uh, let's listen to what he had to say about the United States pledge to India and the pledge from Biden to the Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Let's listen. We are sending immediately a whole series of help that he needs, including providing for those Rindesivir and other drugs that are able to deal with this and prevent, in some cases, but recover, help recovery. Uh, secondly, we are sending the actual mechanical parts that are needed for the machinery they have to build a vaccine. And that's being done as well. We're also discussing, I've discussed with him, when we'll be able to send actual vaccines to India, which will be my intention to do. Joseph, this was a bit of a turnaround by the White House. Initially, they were not prepared to send the raw materials for these vaccines to India. What changed? Uh, everything changed. I mean, uh, a surge in India changed. The fact that the AstraZeneca vaccine became approved or is on the verge of being approved by the FDA, that's another change. But I think the largest change is that Biden's policy people and the people at the CDC uh, and the uh, uh, other uh, government organizations realized that if India is a problem, it's going to be a problem everywhere. If you don't eliminate the virus or at least get it under control, everywhere, or at least in developing countries, that is going to be a problem for the United States. The virus doesn't stay put in one country, not to mention the fact you have very uh, similar variants showing up uh, in India as well as the United States, uh, another indicator that the virus doesn't respect national lines or borders. So I think those two things were the most important uh, aspects of, of, of the about face, plus the fact that the United States has been vaccinating its own citizens at a pretty good clip. Uh, and. Uh, if it continues apace, then the United States will have a significant number of people vaccinated uh, that they can do without uh, and ship some overseas. Will Humble, if we look at the uh, numbers here in the United States, 29% of the U.S. population has now been uh, fully vaccinated and 43% have had at least one dose. Now, there has been some concern over people who will not take the vaccine at all for a number of reasons, but there is another concern now is about people who've had the first dose, but they won't take the second dose. Um, I mean, is one dose enough to protect people? I'll just be honest with you, from a public health perspective, that first dose is my primary concern because it does provide uh, very good protection. Now, ideally, we want to see people get that second dose, 
A bigger problem that I, I think that I'm more concerned about here in the U.S. is that while we are doing fairly well overall, at least in our state in Arizona, we are doing actually quite poorly in lower income neighborhoods among certain subpopulations that are difficult to reach, certain types of employment groups, farm workers, uh, persons experiencing homelessness, et cetera. So um, I'm less concerned about people not taking that second dose than I am other aspects of our response, at least here in Arizona, where lower income communities have just not had the access to the vaccine that wealthy Arizonans have had. And that's something that really needs to change immediately. And it's not just access, it's the fact that the appointment system that, at least in Arizona, that's built is favors wealthy people because they have a good computer, they have internet access, they have the ability to get in their car and go to the vaccination site. And so we see many states in the U.S., Maine, and many others that are actually doing quite well getting into underserved populations. Arizona, not so much. Right. Well, as you point out, notwithstanding the fact that people in low-income areas have not uh, had access to uh, vaccines as people in other areas, you point out that Arizona has done rel relatively well. I mean, some of the figures here, they've only had 750 new cases, no deaths. Um, what has Arizona done to get those numbers down? <laughs> well, quite honestly, part of it's pretty shameful. I mean, there's two ways that you build immunity in a population. Vaccine is the ideal way, because that builds the antibodies in a safe way. What we did in Arizona is had two just terrible waves of infection, one in July of, of 2020 into early August, and a horrible surge in cases in December and January and into early February. So more than 35% of Arizonans were infected with this virus and recovered. And so one reason Arizona is doing well today is in part because we did so poorly early on in the pandemic, and that was a direct result of the decisions that were made by the Arizona governor uh, to uh, to basically stop local jurisdictions from putting in face covering ordinances and other public health measures, and then keeping bars, restaurants, and nightclubs where this virus spread so readily open with abandon and really no limitations at all. Kate, uh, there's been a huge debate that's been going on over countries that have the vaccine and countries that don't have the vaccine. Who should uh, get the vaccine from those countries that have it. The United States has about 60 million doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine, and we know there's been some questions about that vaccine. Uh, but the 60, 60 million doses, rather, could be released relatively quickly. Could the U.S. be doing more for developed, uh, developing countries? Well, I think um, all countries probably could be doing more. The U.S. is the world's largest donor, but the U.N. recommends that wealthy countries give 0.7 percent of their GDP to overseas develop assistance, and the U.S. only gives 0.16, so about one-fourth of what it should give. Uh, you know, so hopefully the U.S. can step up and, and give more to overseas development assistance. I am encouraged by the fact that the U.S. is giving both short-term assistance and long-term assistance to build capacity. So the short-term assistance, you know, would be the, the vaccines, the oxygen, the medical supplies. The long-term assistance is that the um, a development finance corporation in the U.S. is giving Indian uh, vaccine manufacturers very concessional loans so that they can expand their production for the long term. So that will help India now, but also far into the future. Joseph Williams, you know, we know people are desperate to get back to normal, get back to their lives pre-COVID. Uh, there was something of some hope uh, over the weekend. The European Union announced that vaccinated Americans may soon be able to travel to Europe. They would probably like to take vacations in European countries. That still has to be confirmed. Uh, but in the end, of, there's also been lots of talk about vaccine passports. Um, I mean, are there risks in this? Where do you see this going? Well, I mean, certainly there are economic benefits. I mean, the carrot certainly is having uh, five or six million Americans visit a country overseas, uh, and people are yearning to get back to normal. But what has to happen is uh, a, another kind of buckle down and, and wear the masks at home, get the vaccine if you can, and pop and vaccinate underserved populations so that we have security, so that people are able to get back to normal. One of the things that Biden said this afternoon uh, was he was pressing to get young people vaccinated because apparently they're falling off uh, in getting their second shot or getting their first shot at all. 
So I think a lot of the risks are, are, are pretty much present. I mean, we really don't know how well the vaccine does against some of these uh, different strains that have shown up in other countries. We don't know whether or not there's a strain that the United States may be exporting to other countries, and we still haven't completed the job here at home. So there are very many incentives to get things going, to get things back to normal, but we still haven't crossed the finish line, and the virus is going to have the last word. So I think one of the things that we have to be careful about in, in talking about the vaccine passport as well is that we are, are separating the haves from the have-nots, people who can get vaccines from those who can't. So there is still a fairly long way to go before we're through this thing, a fairly long way to go before we get back to normal and some real hurdles that we have to get over uh, before we even come close to being able to travel to Europe freely or be able to travel, you know, really across the United States without wearing a mask. And the one other point, uh, Joseph, is that, I mean, if we look at Europe, we look at travel to Europe, and those are 27 countries, uh, the response to vaccinations and how they've been carried out in these countries is very uneven. There's no kind of benchmark that tells us, look, this country's met the threshold for uh, travel, this country has not. I mean, it's just a blanket thing. Uh, could that, in turn, lead to another wave? It could absolutely lead to another wave, because if you're going into essentially what is a black box in terms of vaccinations, you don't know who's vaccinated, who's not, and that could bring back another vaccination surge or another uh, virus surge to the United mm -hmm. States. Uh, and maybe we're ready for it, maybe we aren't, especially as people become fatigued with the vaccine or with yeah. the uh, COVID restrictions and kind of decelerate and not push all the way through and do what we need to do to get things under control. Will Humble, uh, the United States Centers for Disease Control, the CDC, they've issued new outdoor mask guidelines um, that was issued today uh, for Americans. In essence, it's okay now to go without a mask in small gatherings. It's okay to be outside without a mask. How significant is this, especially for that very long road to, back what, to, to what we've been talking about, getting back to normal? Yeah, well, I think at least in the U.S., I think it makes sense given where we are with the pandemic and what we know in terms of evidence of how this virus spreads in outdoor environments. Um, and I, I do think it's important that when you have evidence that you can release one of these mitigation measures, it's important to do that because it builds more confidence in the population that you're actually using evidence to drive your public policy decision making. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I think it's important that when you can responsibly lift restrictions, that you do that and explain why you can do that, because we need to build confidence with people that our decision makers are actually using evidence, um, right. because you get better compliance when people believe that you're being straight with them. Kate, very quickly, I've only got 30 seconds. Uh, the pause on the Johnson & Johnson vaccine has now been lifted. Uh, how important is that? It's critical because it will allow the U.S. to give the one-shot vaccination, which is J&J. &J. And we have to remember only one in a million people who are vaccinated uh, got this blood clot, and they were almost all women. Mm -hmm. So we can restrict the vaccine uh, not to, you know, just to men and not to women of childbearing age. Okay, thank you everyone for being with us. That is it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Arnand Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for watching.